Welcome to Across the Hall, a podcast sharing ELA strategies from one door away with your host, Kate Summers and Michelle Shelton. This is episode eight, Pirate Pedagogy. Um, today we are so excited that we have Dave Burgess, author of Teach Like a Pirate with us. Hi, Dave. How are you? I am fantastic. I'm excited to join you. Um, I was introduced to Teach Like a Pirate last year, actually on Twitter, and then I did the Ditch Conference the, um, with Matt Miller and got to see you some that way. And then I also, whenever you came to Alabama in person, I had to be there. Um, so I am so inspired by you and so excited that you're here. And uh, so um, we just would like to know first, just tell us a little bit about this pirate thing. Teach Like a Pirate. Why a pirate? Yeah, it's kind of a crazy thing, isn't it? People, a lot of times people ask me, they'll see my shirt and they'll say, teach like a pirate? What is that about? And I always tell them, hey, it's got nothing to do with the dictionary definition. Like, we don't want teachers to go out and attack and rob ships at sea, right? It's all about the spirit of a pirate. To me, it's about embracing the spirit of a pirate. And the spirit of a pirate is someone who is unconventional, someone who's willing to reject the status quo, someone who's willing to sail into uncharted waters with no guarantee of success, a risk taker, a rebel, a maverick. So it's embracing that spirit of being a pirate. In addition to that, the P-I-R-A-T-E of the word pirate is an acronym. Each one of those letters stands for something in the pirate system. And then also pirates are known for having hooks. This is all about how you can hook students uh, with what you do in your classroom to draw them almost magically or magnetically into what you're doing in your rooms. And so that's kind of the three layers of the pirate metaphor. Awesome. Um, okay, so talking about these hooks, because I know that that is a big part of the book. Um, whenever I came to your conference, there was something on the screen that got everyone's attention. So um, how do these hooks work in getting the students engaged? Absolutely. So there's 30 some odd hooks in the book and all of them are different. All of them uh, address different parts of the learning experience. And it's sort of like I look at it as a presentational toolbox. Like if you do any of these things every day, they lose their impact. Right. But these are all ideas that you can throw and build a larger presentational toolbox in order to engage kids. And so there's incorporation of art and music and movement and costuming and interior design. And I always tell people like, hey, you're the you're the set designer. You're the choreographer you're the director you're the producer you're the light tech of your show and so you need to control all these elements of your environment to create the most immersive experience for for kids in the most powerful learning environment that you possibly can and so that's a big part of the teach like a pirate system is using these hooks not just to teach a lesson but to create an experience you can see lessons are easily forgotten right but experiences live forever like they may forget some of that prohibition lecture that you gave but they'll never forget going to the speakeasy. So it's taking the content that we teach and, and, and creating an experience for us. So here's my content, not good enough. How do I make this come alive? How do I make this memorable? How do I create an experience around this? Oh, that is awesome. Um, okay. Yeah, so some of those that I, that I really liked um, deal with things like uh, the, the idea of uh, incorporating crafts and incorporating dance. Um, just making class a lot more fun. Um, and I would love for you to just describe a few of those, if you don't mind, whether it's some of the ones I just said or some of your favorite, um, some of your favorite, favorite hooks. And then I, I do have kind of a follow-up question, but I'm really interested in, in hearing a few of those for anyone who's not familiar with them. Yeah, so here's the, here's the problem. Uh, there's a phrase that's used all the time in education. You probably heard it used. People say it with a really serious face when they say it. And it, it, it sounds like this. Literacy is not the English teacher's job. <laughs> Literacy is everyone's job, right? And um, you've probably heard that. Well, so here's the thing. Right. I, I agree with that. I actually agree with that. But this is the Teach Like a Pirate corollary to that. That's true for every subject, not just literacy. It's true of math and science and social studies and, and art and music, like things like art and music. That's not just something for kids to do over when they're in this part of the building over here. Things like art and music technology, when they're woven throughout the curriculum, that's, what, that's part of what brings school alive for kids and helps them process things in different ways and develop a creative spirit. Now, things like art and music, they're not measured on your state test probably, right? But you know where they're measured? They're measured in life, with a richer and more fulfilled life. And it adds that, uh, it adds that, that, that richness to stuff that, that helps the kids process things and to learn it. And so when you incorporate more art and music in your lesson and these things that are fun, um, then you're going to have to spend less 
less time reteaching because he created a more powerful experience the first time, less time in review, less time, all, all, all that time you're going to save. Uh, and so people are worried about the extra time of teaching like a pirate. It, it's not going to cost you time. It's going to save you time in the long run because you're going to create something that they have great retention of. Yeah, I find, I definitely find that to be the case in my classroom. Um, some of the times when it's dry and boring, um, which I try to avoid as much as possible, but those moments are the moments that they forget. The moments when we, when we come to a point of assessment, when we're wanting to go back and see how well they know something or how well they can do something, they forget those things. So your point, I, I, definitely, uh, I definitely understand that. And I've, in my own experiences in trying to practice the things that you teach. Uh, have found the great benefit of the lasting memory of the experience that you describe. One of the questions that I would have kind of following up with that is about balancing. Um, what is your approach to trying to balance the fun with the productive action? Yeah, so some people will have, they'll, they'll tell me that, you know what, I have a real problem in my classroom. And the problem is, is that I get, I've incorporated some of your ideas and, and I get the kids so wound up and excited that then I, I can't bring them back down in order to teach my content. And one of the things I always tell them is, what a wonderful problem to have. Where your problem is that you have kids so pumped up to be there and so wound up to be at school that you're having trouble bringing them down as opposed to what many teachers' problem is where they have kids falling asleep in their desk or, 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 or texting on their phone because they're, they're, bored, they're bored out of their minds by what's happening in school. And so I, I'd rather err on that side than err on the other side. But it's also, there's a, it's an art. And so there's a science of teaching and art, and the art is to know how far you can take them, how excited you can get them, how much transitional time you have to leave in between, and, and, and how to incorporate rituals to bring them back into, into the learning. But um, what I, people that are concerned about whether or not, uh, now I use, I, there's an R word, like you know how some people say, never say the F word? Yeah. Well, there's an R word that I feel the same about, and the R word is rigor. And um, look, look up the definition of that word sometime in the dictionary and see if that's what we want, you want to describe your class. And um, really I, always tell, yeah, I, I always tell people, it, it doesn't matter what you say if nobody's listening. Oh, that's true. And so it, it always goes back to engagement. And so people are saying like, well, but this is going to take you know, 10 extra minutes if I add this hook here and do all that kind of stuff like this. Like, well, you know what? But, but then you're going to gain time because they're going to be, they're going to be engaged. And they're going to be with you. So it doesn't matter what you're saying if nobody's listening. You can teach all you want, but if they're not listening to you, then it doesn't matter. And so uh, and another thing that kind of ties into this is people will say, you know what? I don't think you're preparing them for the real world. <laughs> because they're going to get to college and their professor isn't going to care whether they're engaged and having fun and their boss when they get to work isn't going to say hey are you having fun today and all that kind of stuff and what a horrible argument that is that's like saying hey you know what life is going to suck for you later <laughs> and, and, and to get you ready for it we're going to make sure it sucks for you now too <laughs> That's, that's, that's yeah, that's no, no, you're really that's, looking college and career no, ready. No argument. That's no argument for a teacher. Yeah. I have I actually, at all. I've heard teachers say that a lot. So quite often they say that. Um, so I know that the P stands for passion, right? So um, what about these teachers who say, well, I don't really have any passions. I don't really know anything that I, that I know about that I can bring into the classroom that would get my students engaged. Um, how, can I, how can I encourage those teachers to get passionate about what they're doing? Yeah, so they're wrong. And so uh, everyone's passionate about certain things. And so uh, that's why I broke passion into three categories. And this was because of a, a problem I was having. And that I came, I, I was not a history uh, major. And I'm not a person that goes home from school and watches the History Channel and reads history books and historical fiction for fun and all that. that that's not who I am, right? And so I was a person that came to it late in the game. And so there was a lot of my content that, to be perfectly honest, I, I wasn't that into. So how am I? I going to come here and be passionate in front of my kids and so because what I always tell people is like don't expect people to be passionate about stuff that you're not passionate about like a, a teacher will come to me and say I just don't understand what's happening kids just don't seem excited about school <laughs> and I'll go yeah I just can't imagine why they're not excited in your class look at you you're just a fireball <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and so no, so there's three categories of passion. Uh, one of them is your one of them is your content. 
What is it in your content area that you're passionate about, that you're on fire about, that you're excited to teach? But then there's two other areas that we can all get passionate about. One of them is your professional passions. So what is it about the profession of education outside of your subject matter that you're passionate about? And these are things like developing lifelong learners and having kids leave class with a larger vision of what they're capable of than when they walked in and embedding character development and character building into all the things that we teach. And if you can't get passionate about stuff like that, then you do need to choose another profession, right? Absolutely. And so it's those professional passions. And then I'll, the third category is your personal passions. What is it completely outside of your profession that you're passionate about and trying to draw those in as well because that's uh, not only does it make you a more powerful educator because you're presenting more often from a place of passion you're more mm -hmm. fulfilled you're more fulfilled as an educator but then also is you're developing rapport and relationships with kids because you're uh, you're sharing some of yourself as a part of what you do in your classroom and so that, that, that's an important part of it also when you can combine all three layers of that passion together that's when you become really uncompromising and relentless in that pursuit of excellence and greatness. And um, you become that passion monster in your classroom. Right. I mean, I, I don't guess I'm having any more fun than whenever I'm pulling in Broadway tunes. And, <laughs> and as boring as that might be um, on the surface for my ninth graders, they actually end up really liking it because they see how excited I am. Yeah. Do you sing for them? Yes. Yes, I do sing for them. Occasionally I dance. It's not pretty. Okay, so let's talk about that. And, and you know, Kate, you mentioned the dancing and all, and all that too. So let's talk about this for a second. Okay. Uh, let's talk about singing and dancing in class. Um, I'm for it. <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge proponent of it. Okay. And, but, what, but, but before someone says, no, you, you don't understand. I, I, I can't sing. Let, let me just tell you something. If you can't sing, that's way better. That's way better. That's, that's not an excuse not to do it. That's a reason to do it. Right? If, if, you can, if you can dance in your, in your classroom and you dance, whatever. If you can't dance and you dance in your classroom, that's so much more engaging for a kid. So I, I don't buy into this. And, and people say, well, I'm not the kind of person that's the personality that would dress up for my students. Mm -hmm. And then I, the, immediately what I tell them is, well, then it would have way more impact when you do it. Exactly. So when I dress up, I mean, it's just another crazy thing that Mr. Burgess does, right? But mm -hmm. if it's totally out of your character to dress up and you dress up, it's going to have monster impact in your classroom. And it might be a little bit uncomfortable for you, but you know what? All progress is found outside of your comfort zone. And so if you're never willing to be uncomfortable, then you're not growing as an educator. And so sometimes these things are going to be outside of your comfort zone. You have to push through that. We, talk, we tell kids to do that all the time, don't we? we Absolutely. Say, you got to have a growth mindset. Like a kid says, <laughs> like, I'm not good at math. And you say, like, no, you're not good at math yet. Or, you yeah. know, I'm not, I, don't, I, don't feel, I, I don't feel comfortable speaking in front of the class. Do we say, oh, well, okay, then you never have to speak in front of the class this year. Never mind. Just go back to your seat. Oh, no. no. We have to develop that growth mindset. We give them the skill and the confidence to be able to do it over the course of the year, right? Right. And so, but then we have to direct that same focus towards ourselves, where you'll see people say, well, I, I'm, not, like, I'm not comfortable using technology, so I'm not going to use it in my class. Well, what do you mean by that? Like, so you don't have a growth mindset? You can't learn how to use it? We want our kids to have that mindset, so let's have that mindset too. Right. Okay. And so the I is immersion. Um, explain what immersion means as it relates to the classroom and engagement. As opposed to what it means to becoming a better lover, you mean? <laughs> no, they have to kill go to the workshop. You're killing me, Dave. You're workshop. killing me. Yeah. They have to go to the workshop for that part. <laughs> yes, uh, they do. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, the immersion is this, and that uh, when you're in the presence of someone who is fully immersed in the moment with you, and every cell, fiber, piece of their soul is immersed and committed to that unfolding moment with you. It's almost magical in nature. Right. It has a magnetic pull to it. It has a hypnotic quality, actually. How can you look away from someone who is totally immersed with you? It's almost overwhelming when someone's that immersed. And, and so we can use that to draw kids into what we're, what we're doing in class. And so that immersion in the classroom is, is it's not just in the classroom. It's as a parent. And in life in general, it, it can be, it's a game changer. Right. And, and I just remembered the, um, the hook you had on the board that we will just, we'll save for the people who go to your, hear you speak. Um, so R, 
<laughs> so I put him on the spot. That was um, totally my bad. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Michelle. You're welcome. So the R uh, in, uh, in pirate is rapport. Tell us a little bit about what rapport means. Yeah, so there's lots of reasons why you want to build rapport. It's the center of the word. It's the heart of the word pirate, uh, the R, and it's the heart of teaching, building rapport and relationships with kids. And so it always comes back to that. I invest time on the front end to build a psychologically safe environment for my students, a place where they're comfortable and feel safe, supported, and willing to take a risk and do some things that are a little outside of their comfort zone and a little bit scary for them. And so when you create that psychologically safe environment for kids, then it might, it might be an investment on the front end, but it's gonna pay dividends for the whole rest of the year. And so that's the section where I talk about like my first day, three days of school and how I develop uh, that, that, that environment. And just in general, how uh, we create that place for kids where they want, they're desperate and knocking down the walls to be. And if you think about um, what, what do you want a kid to say about your class at the end of the word, like if they could only choose five words to describe your class, what would you want them to say at the end of the year? And like, what if a kid said something like, safe they only got five words but they chose a word like safe maybe the only place in their life but in your classroom they felt safe that's a powerful thing right or that family is, yes and and so uh building rapport with kids it, it helps you there, there's there's three reasons why you do it one of them is because it gives you the information to create powerful hooks like how are you going to know how to engage your kids if you don't know your kids Absolutely. And so I want, to know what, I want to know what my kids are into. I want to know what music they listen to. I want to know what television shows they watch. I want to know what movie they're excited about that's coming out this weekend. I want to know what their extracurricular hobbies and interests are, because that's all ammunition I can use to, to connect with them and to tie my content to as well. And so that's one reason. The second reason is that um, it, it allows you to create buy-in. You have to have buy-in with your kids. If you're going to have some wild and crazy stuff doing and coming, coming down in your room, you got to have some buy-in with them. And so rapport allows you to create that buy-in, especially with two groups of kids. One, the introverted, shy kids. And two, the kids that are too cool for school. You have mm -hmm. to have buy-in. And then the third reason is it allows you to develop relationships of influence. That's why I got into teaching. I, get into, I didn't get into teaching to teach them about the, the railroads. Right, <laughs> right. To, to, to create a relationship of influence with young people, and so, uh, but this is the problem we don't get to choose who we have an influence over, they get to choose whether they're going to see us as the kind of person that they're going to allow that position in their life, they get to choose whether they're going to see us as a role model in their life. And so, building rapport and relationships with kids is one of the most powerful ways that you can make sure that that does happen. Absolutely. So uh, I know that I know the A is to ask and analyze, but what you just said made me think a little bit about uh, what I've tried to accomplish at the beginning of the year, trying to build rapport. I can always do better at that, but it also connects with the asking and analyzing part. I was just thinking today, uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun in my class and we've learned a lot along the way, but then there are those days where I just feel like um, I, I feel like I've got to get back to some uh, nuts and bolts of my curriculum. I feel like sometimes I don't integrate it well enough. And, uh, and so that's where one of my, my struggles is. Um, you have a section about failure and feedback. And as I was sitting with a couple of students today trying to offer feedback, I found myself uh, almost, we were, you know, I'm trying to get into proficient and proficiency and mastery, looking at uh, a standards-based grading system as opposed to just the traditional grading system. And as I'm trying to explain proficient and you're not there yet, I found myself almost settling for a negative perspective on proficiency. And I, and I just thought about this interview today and thought about that section. And I just want to know, how do you handle uh, the failure versus feedback part of, of the A? Yeah. So, uh, Here's the thing, everything, sometimes I'll have a teacher and they'll come to me and they'll say, I'm, you know what, like this, my classroom is disaster. I, I'm ready, I'm gonna quit. I, I'm, I'm just not cut out for this. And they'll just be at this, in total despair. And I'll say, all right, well, well tell me what happened. And they'll tell me what happened. And it turns out what happened is maybe they had a lesson where, let's say they have 30 kids. 29 of those kids were engaged in the lesson, but one kid over in the corner popped off and said something rude or was distracted or, or disrupted the lesson. And, and they'll walk away from that experience feeling like they're a total failure. And that life isn't 100% or fail. 
and, and, and neither is teaching. And so it, it's, this is not about creating some nirvana level of perfection in our lessons. This is about getting better. It's about improving. It's about uh, iteration after iteration, which gets better and better and better. And so everything that happens in the classroom is feedback. It's not failure. Turn failure into feedback. And so don't personalize it. Don't beat yourself up about it. Don't beat kids up about it. It's all feedback. Everything that happens in the classroom is feedback. They're providing you the real-time gift of feedback to help you improve and hone your craft. And so you use that feedback to make shifts in courses and adjustments to get to where you need to go. Pirates trim their sails based on the wind, right? They have, they fought, they're, they're watching the currents and they're watching the wind and they have a compass and they trim their sails accordingly to that wind, right? So that you don't see them arguing with the wind. They don't fight with the wind. They don't get mad at the wind. Say like, ah, oh, the wind changed. I guess we're just done with this journey. Forget it, let's just go home. <laughs> No, they, they shift their sails, they catch the wind, and they keep going. And that's how we have to look at the, the things that happen in our classroom. And it's all feedback. It's all wind. How are you going to shift your sails and catch that wind and, and keep going and, get, and reach your destination? So one of the things that I have um, experienced that has been concerning to me and, it, and has gotten to me, and I've taken it too personally, is as I've gotten outside the box and started teaching differently and making things more student-centered, I've had students who, who I've overheard say, she doesn't teach. And that is a smack in the face whenever you've really oh, yeah. just prepared something ahead of time and, and prepared these experiences, but they're used to teaching looking a certain way. So how can other teachers who may have heard that same kind of comment from um, students feel, feel a little bit better about themselves? Yeah, you know, so most often I hear that uh, same question, but it's not students who say it, it's other teachers. Well, that too, that too, yeah. yes. Uh, and so um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off the rails just for a second and, and tell you a little story if that's okay. That's absolutely fine. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I have a lesson on the Berlin airlift, and it's got a lot of stuff about the, uh, the, that, sec that area of the Cold War, but the, the centerpiece of the new information is on the Berlin airlift. Now, at the end of that lesson, I'm gonna have them create some sort of flying device. They're gonna create like paper airplanes, things like this, and I have a whole like, area of the room where they're gonna try to fly and reach their plane into West Berlin to deliver supplies. And if it goes outside of West Berlin, I'm saying, oh, no, communist territory. No, we have to get those supplies to West Berlin. And so I'm reinforcing so that so the kids quickly make their planes and they're having fun. They get around people that know how to make, like, who knows how to make a plane. And so they get around the experts in the room that know stuff. They're learning from each other. They're creating this hands-on thing, which is fun. And they're all lining up and they're, we're flying and trying to get supplies into West Berlin. And then before the bell rings, uh, by the way, so and I'm reinforcing the content the whole time as we're talking about the communist territory and where they need to get and all that and why it's important. And then we, as before the bell rings we go outside and there's a little uh, grass bank leave, that leads down from my classroom and we fly for distance and the furthest three planes are gonna I'm gonna give some sort of like prize to and if they're if their plane is one of the furthest three you see them racing down the hill grabbing their plane racing back up and trying to become and they're throwing the plane over and over again trying to become the furthest three planes and now the bell rings and, and, they, and they head off to their next class holding their planes well the first thing that's gonna happen is they're gonna run into their peers in the hallway and their friend is going to say, um, "Hey, what? Like, what, what's up with the plane?" And then, the, and, and my student is going to say, "Oh, we were learning about the Berlin airlift in class today." And that 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 other kid is going to say, "You got to be kidding me! We just did three worksheets on the Berlin airlift." And then my student will say, "Yeah, I know, because uh, my teacher takes the extra worksheets from your teacher, and we make planes out of them." <laughs> right? and, 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 and then and then they're going to get to they're going to get to their next class. And um, maybe, now I don't know if you're aware of this, but did you know that sometimes 16 or 17 year old kids don't make the best decisions? <laughs> no, really? <laughs> and, and, and so maybe a kid flies a plane in the next class and gets in trouble. Or maybe oh, yeah. they, a, group of my, a group of my kids just walk in with their planes. And, and then the teacher says, what's up with those planes? Now, does the kid say, well, Mr. Burgess gave a 45 minute lecture on the Berlin airlift and then added a kinesthetic activity with a hands-on with a hands-on art and craft project that re all the while reinforced his content and made a learning experience that was so powerful that I'll never forget it and I can't wait to get back in class tomorrow <laughs> to see what we're going to learn next. Not at all. Is that what the teacher, is that what the kid says or does the kid say, 
because uh, 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 we were flying planes in Burgess's class. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what the kid says, right? And so it's not unnatural for that teacher then to think, oh, well, it would be easy to be popular and win awards and all that kind of stuff. Like he's just over there, like doing magic tricks and building paper airplanes all day, right? right. And but here's, okay. the, here's the thing. So part of it is a, is a matter of uh, ignorance. And I don't mean ignorance in a bad way, like they're stupid. I mean, ignorance in just that they don't know. Right. That, uh, what your class is about. And those kids don't know maybe that these instructional strategies are specially designed for them to succeed. And that there's a, and that's why like my third day of school is called the method to the madness. Why well, explain to the kids, this class is going to be different than anything you've ever seen before. And here's why here's the brain research behind this and why it works. You're going to learn more than ever before in the history of your educational experience. And you're going to do it in a faster fashion and I tell them so I'm actually giving them the philosophy behind what I'm doing on that third day of school but then that teacher now we work in a weird profession I've worked with some teachers for like you know 15 years and never once seen them teach a lesson and they've never seen me teach a lesson because we teach at the same time right right mm -hmm. oh hold on just a second day okay that's okay our internet just kind of got we got glitchy for a second but we're back Okay. okay, you said we teach at the same time. Okay. Well, edit yeah, that. and so the other, the other thing that happens, though, is that uh, that teacher, it, they might be, say, some, they might, um, they might be struggling with their class. And they might not feel good about the fact that kids in it come in excited about your class. Now, now here, this is going to be, this is going to be a painful statement to say, mm -hmm. but it's going to ring true. If you create a class that is wildly and outrageously successful and popular with kids, that's not gonna make everybody on your campus happy. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. And they're gonna seek reasons for why kids like your class and not their class, and they're not likely to be self-reflective self and empowering reasons. They're gotcha. likely to be more judgmental reasons. And so, um, we, but as a teacher, like a pirate style teacher, you have to have the intestinal for the possible, if not likely face of criticism from peers. So what would you suggest if we are trying to not only make that kind of significant impact upon our kids, what would you suggest as ways for us to collegially impact uh, the faculty around us with that same sort of enthusiasm and spirit? Yeah, so part of it is modeling what you uh, want to see. Part of it is um, exposure to it, right? It is offering them exposure to it. But then, I, like when I look at cultural change on a campus, um, what, I, what I talk about is building a snowball. And so here's how I look at this. If you want to change the culture on your school's campus, you need to look at it like this. Um, if, if you wanted to build a, a, a giant snowball and you went out into the snow and you tried to grab it all up into your arms at the same time, what would happen? It's gonna crumble, it's going everywhere. <laughs> it would crumble away and you would wind up, le you would be left with nothing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not the way that you build a snowball. The way that you build a snowball is you get a little bit in your hands and you shape it and you mold it and you work with it and you pack it tight. And then when that's shaped and molded, you add a little bit more and then a little bit more. And eventually it gets big enough where you can actually put it on the ground and roll it and the snow will all stick to it and you can build a giant, huge snowball. That's the only way to build a giant snowball. And it's the only way to change culture on a campus too. Change cannot be announced from the podium, okay? Change mm -hmm. is something that's built at a grassroots level. And so... Uh, you find that group of people that do want to be a part of something new and innovative and creative and you work with them. That's your initial little bit in your hands, your snowball, and you, you work with each other and support each other. And, and it's the energy that radiates out from that group which starts to attract other people in. People say, hey, I want to know what that is, that stuff that you're all, you guys are always talking about. I want to be a part of that. Like your kids are coming out of your class excited. What's happening there? And then you bring them in, you add them to the snowball, and eventually it gets big enough where you can put it down this, in the, in, on the ground in your system and you can roll it and the, and the snow starts to stick and you have momentum. But it always starts with that small little group. So don't be concerned about people that won't change. Don't let your energy be dissipated with negativity on your campus. 
find where the positivity is, where people are ready to change, work with that group, and then that's the area that's going to grow. And, and, and you'll have put all your energy there, and then the others will be drawn in. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm just taking in what you said because I was so excited about what you were saying because that's it's so very affirming. It's amazing advice. Amazing advice. It is really good advice. Um, okay, so uh, T, transformation, which is a powerful word in and of itself. So what, what is that in the pirate mentality? Yes, yeah, so this is all about how uh, I, I want to transform school for my students. I want to transform what they believe is possible in their life, right? And so uh, it's about all the things that you can do to control this how they look at school, how they look at your content, and how you can transform your lessons into these, these, these experiences that have them knocking down the walls to get in. And so in this section, it has the two essential questions of Teach Like a Pirate. And one of those questions is, do I have any lessons I could sell tickets for? Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it's a bar raising question, right? It's, hey, we're, we're not trying to design lessons that just eliminate behavior management issues. We're trying to less, design lessons that have kids running to get into school instead of running to get out. Right. And so, um, do you have any ticket lessons? Do you have any lessons if there was a cash register at the door and they had to drop, a, uh, drop some money and to come in, do you have any where they would come in still? And, and so I'm trying to create as many ticket lessons as I can. And then the, the, the other question, and it's actually the essential question of Teach Like a Pirate. So, and it's this, if they didn't have to be there, would you be teaching to an empty room? Like if your class was optional, if school was just optional, if they didn't have to be there, would you be teaching to an empty room? Ooh. Or is there something, that, something about you that would draw them there anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And, and th those are the teachers that we want to be. And so um, that's, that's the, the central part of the transformation chapter of Teach Like a Pirate. Th th those are hard questions. Those, those hurt just a little bit. Just take it as rhetorical. They, take it as rhetorical right now, Michelle. You, you, have, time, <laughs> yeah. you have time before you're tested. Okay. Yeah, those, are, those, are, those are soul searching questions. Right. Um, so the, la the last letter in pirate is a enthusiasm and you have it all over you. So um, just go ahead and talk to us about enthusiasm. Yeah, so it starts with a quote from Carlos Santana. And it says, enthusiasm is the most contagious thing in the world. The songs become incidental. What people receive is your joy. And that's the way I look at teaching, is that the lessons become incidental and what kids receive is our joy. And they're drawn in, uh, it, it, it's contagious. When you're around someone who's enthusiastic, uh, you, you want to be around them more often, that they bring you up. And so um, it's about how you can bring that enthusiasm every day. And the, the simple fact of the matter is that you won't always feel enthusiastic. Right. So how can you do it anyway? And so there's two different ways you can control your state that I talk about in that. And, and one is by what you focus on, one is your, your mind, your, what you, uh, what you focus on creates your reality. Mm -hmm. And so by changing what you focus on, you can change your state. And then the other thing is your physiology is that a short circuit path to changing your state. Uh, this is something I learned from uh, reading Tony Robbins. And that is that if you, a short circuit path to changing your state is to change your physiology. Like if you, you want to be a more dynamic speaker, then speak in a more dynamic way. If you want to be more enthusiastic, then act more enthusiastic. Right? So, and it seems simplistic, but it's true. And when you act enthusiastic, there's this strange loop that connects and you actually become more enthusiastic. And so your physiology changes your state. And this, this, will, this will ring true for you in this way. Have you ever been in that spot where maybe it's the afternoon, you've come over school, you're sitting down, you have the remote in your hand and your, your eyes become so heavy that you can't even possibly keep them open. Like you feel like they're like, they weigh like a hundred pounds each, your eyelids. And maybe you've dozed off a couple of times and you drop the remote out of your hand and you just can't imagine doing anything else but sleep in that moment. Oh yeah. And, and then your cell phone rings and you pick it up and you realize, oh my God, I forgot to pick up my kids or something like that happens, right? Mm -hmm. well, in a split second, you can go from a, a, a state where you could not imagine doing anything but sleep to a state where you can't imagine possibly going to sleep because oh, yeah. of what you just heard. Mm -hmm. The only thing that happened, the only thing that changed 
was in your mind. The mind is powerful. And so we have to learn to use it in, in powerful ways to control our state and our emotions. Wow, yeah. That's really amazing. Uh, you know, we just uh, recently read, my students just recently read in a text, Freedom is a State of Mind, um, looking back at integration of a school in 1957 in Arkansas. And that's, that just totally relates. So much of this I'm going to be sharing directly with them. I don't know about you, Michelle. I'm really excited just to kind of, hey, kids, uh, let's sit down today and listen to a stand, walk around, play music, whatever, while, while, they, while Dave Burgess teaches us a few lessons about, <laughs> about a, you know, a successful classroom. Right. So um, um, part two of your book is crafting engaging lessons. And I know that some teachers would be really overwhelmed with thinking about this pirate mentality, but this is where kind of rubber meets the road. You got to actually sit down and choose your lesson. What are you going to do? So what does that look like for them? Yeah, so this is where, uh, I mean, this is the real practical part of the book. This is the right. book where uh, when, te when teachers come up at a uh, workshop and they have me sign their book, this is the part that's, that's tabbed, highlighted, uh, bookmarked. And this is where there's a whole, you know, there's 170 of the kind of questions I ask about lessons are all right there, bolted off with pirate coins in the center of the book under 30 different categories of hook. And so this is where you just take that lesson, maybe even that you're already teaching, and this is, you can go there and ramp it up and kick it up that little extra notch and, and make it um, a more transformative experience for your kids. And so it's that whole toolbox mentality. And it, it, it comes in the form of questions because I get, again, I think questions are the key to creativity. Like if you wanna change a teacher's classroom, change their questions. If you change the questions that they ask about their lesson design, you can change their whole class. And so I don't wanna just tell you all the stuff that I do. I want to give you the question that, I, that, I, that brought me to that spot so that you can ask that question about your curriculum and you can design something for your classroom. Like I know you have mainly an ELA audience. And so because I'm a US history teacher, that doesn't mean this isn't gonna be for you. Those right. questions are for any content area, any grade level. And so that's a real super critical part of the book. I'm trying to hit, like when I'm speaking and when I'm, uh, what I was writing, I try to hit a 50-50 split. Like if you see me do a keynote, 50% of the time, I'm trying to pump you up. I'm trying to get you ready to knock down a wall. I'm trying, maybe you think you're listening to like a Zig Ziglar motivational speech or like a Southern Baptist preacher, okay? Yes, yes. Right? And 50% of the time, I'm actually literally modeling and demonstrating the engagement strategy as if the audience are the students of my class. And so I want there to be that practical component and that inspirational component. So you won't do the practical stuff if you're not fired up, but if you get fired up and you don't know what to do, that's no good either. And so right. you have to have both. And so that's why that center section of the book is super important. Okay. Um, so after I, I listened to your keynote this summer, uh, I actually sent you a message on Twitter and said, okay, Dave, uh, how in the world do you keep up this kind of energy on a daily basis? And because I know that that's what a lot of people probably say to you, right? Yeah, so I've often um, thought that if at the end of my uh, program, if instead of just having books there at the table, um, I had a little bottle that said like pirate energy, <laughs> that I, I could probably make a whole lot of money. You'd make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, but, but anyway, yeah, but it's, it goes back to the enthusiasm chapter. It's about controlling your state. And it's that, that focus, the physiology and what you focus on. And so I would also tell you um, that like, if you see me do a keynote, mm -hmm. um, I'm doing a show, right? I'm putting on a show for you. Right. And if you were to walk in my classroom, on any given moment, I'm not doing a somersault and, land, and uh, double flip mm -hmm. and landing in, a, in, in the splits, mm -hmm. right? I'm not swinging from a chandelier all the time. Um, and so I'm handpicking some things from my keynote that are gonna demonstrate some of my strategies and points. But I'm also going to have time where kids are collaborating and working together. I'm going to have times where they're working on a project or they're uh, reviewing or whatever it might be. And so um, maybe you get a little bit of a, um, a stilted view of my classroom if you just come to the keynote. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is what I often tell people too. It wouldn't even be appropriate for me to be like that all the time in my classroom. Because that would be me on stage all the time. And there needs, there needs to be time where kids are owning their own learning. Oh, and yeah. so uh, it, it's not something where you're going to, at the start of the day, you're going to start, um, you know, your full cardio teaching workout and not <laughs> until six hours later. 
Right. Um, so one of the segments that we have on our podcast is called hashtag the struggle. And normally, you know, Cade and I are just talking about that, but there was something in particular that he wanted to ask. Yeah. So this is the way we always end our show, uh, Dave. It's the way, the way that we reflect on our last week or a couple weeks of instruction or just professional life. And um, as I was looking at your book, one of the things that I thought, uh, you know, was left with little mention, but probably if, if you're, I infer, is probably everything to you, you know, countless pages more than, than what is included in the book is in your acknowledgement section. So the section about your family uh, and the impact that um, your family has on you. And so I was just thinking about, you know, in those acknowledgements, um, my own personal life in my fourth year teaching, uh, I struggle with balance. So, you know, in my, in my life, I need more time spent with my family, my wife, my kids, and more time doing uh, things with them than going home and being stuck in the professional, you know, rut. Um, I know you appreciate that. Tell us a little bit about how you make it and feel free to, to describe any of that that uh, is meaningful to you. Yeah, so, well, you should probably ask my wife whether or not I'm good at that or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't ask mine. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so balance is a tough thing. Here, here's, the, here's the thing. We work on a job where we can never be done. That's dangerous. It's dangerous. We can never be done. Like, when was the last time you heard a teacher say, I've actually got everything all set for the next few weeks? Oh, no. Never, never right? Not, for, right. Not, not a good one. Not a good And so uh, there's always something more we can do. And we know how important what we do is. So it makes us feel guilty at time that we spend outside of education. Mm -hmm. But every time I've honored my outside passions and interests or been willing to develop new ones, it's always come back to inform my teaching. It's always come back to make me a, a better teacher. And, and so um, not only does it create a more balanced human being, which is going to make me better for my kids in the long run, but it also gives me creative ammunition from other areas in my life to bring back into my classroom. And so actually, Teach Like a Pirate is a very strange book. You might not have considered this, but there is not one single educational book reference, referenced inside of it. Not, not a single one. Not because I don't like education books. I publish them. It's because that's not where it came from. It was from the outside drawn in. It's like my background as a coach has influenced how I give feedback to students, how I break down instruction, and how I develop, deliver, deliver hopefully an inspirational component to my class in addition to the content. My background as a marketer and entrepreneur has, how, is like how I create buzz and anticipation, like how a marketer creates buzz for a new product. I, I create buzz for my lessons, right? Um, and so I use their sales and marketing techniques to sell content to my kids. And um, my background as a magician has influenced my sense of staging and showmanship and incorporation of props, okay? And now um, I know that um, you've seen me speak. So like my, my, my background as a, as a rapper, now, this, this always makes people laugh, but that's all right. I mean, there, 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 were, there were three years of my life where you could not have convinced me I was going to be anything but a rapper. You couldn't have convinced me. Right, I was making tapes. I had all I cared about was getting back in my dorm room with my two Techniques twelve hundred turntables, my microphone, my mixer, and my eight hundred eight drum machine. And so, um, but if you see me speak, do you think that my background as an MC has influenced my professional speaking style? Absolutely. Absolutely, right? I'm a person that's used to speaking in a fast and flourishy way in front of people. Mm -hmm. And so it's influenced my speaking style. All these things have come together to create the best me in the classroom. Teach Like a Pirate is not about you teaching like me, though. It's about taking your strengths, your talents, things that you're into, things that your students are into, and weaving those all together to create the best you. And so um, the more balanced you are as a human being, the more able you're going to be able to bring stuff from outside into your classroom. That's going to make you more powerful in the long run anyway. Right. Thanks for answering that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you've inspired me and I'm, I'm uh, excited to apply it. I'll even talk to my wife about it when I get home. <laughs> there you go. Excellent. Honey, I'm going to be talking about you in class because you're my passion. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That, that could tie back into that I chapter if we wanted it to. But there yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it could. <laughs> and it's time to end the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dave, we're so, 
so very excited that you um, have spent this time with us. Thank you so much. Um, I know that you published so many books. Um, the whole pirate series is just crazy on Twitter. Everything that I see pretty much has your hand in it. Um, so I know that you're one busy man and I'm so thankful to you for, for spending this time with us. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure to join you guys. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. And as far as the, you know, the Twitter, it's one of the great places where we're teachers are connecting. Make sure you get connected. Um, I'm at Burgess Dave there. So my name mm -hmm. just flipped around into Burgess Dave. The hashtag people often use is TLAP for Teach Like a Pirate. And it's our complete honor to find um, these uh, other educators with powerful messages and help them spread their message as well with these other books. And so I never meant Teach Like a Pirate to be the full story. It's my story. Mm -hmm. So now it's fun to find people with, um, to contribute and to grow that story and to take it other, other directions in other ways. And so it's just our honor to publish all those books. So for our, our listeners who may not know what we're talking about, can, could you just you know, mention a couple of those books that they might like to go and um, check out? Yeah, if you're an avid reader of professional development books, maybe some of your favorite books are uh, published right here at this house. Um, we just decided, I was so upset with the traditional publishing world. Um, I always use the phrase, the only thing missing to me was a ski mask and a gun. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we run the publishing business right out of our house here in San Diego. And we publish like The Innovator's Mindset by George Kuros and Kids Deserve It by uh, Adam Welcome and Todd Nesloni, Launched by AJ Giuliani and John Spencer, All the Pirate Books, Play Like a Pirate, Learn Like a Pirate, Explore Like a Pirate, Lead Like a Pirate, um, and um, Ditch That Textbook by Matt Miller, all the Alice Keeler books, like all the Google Classroom books and all those things. And we, 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 there's over 30, I think over 34 books now that we publish. So they all are published right here in our house in San Diego. That is crazy. And that, that is so awesome and inspiring. Um, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. It was absolutely my pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to episode eight, Pirate Pedagogy. Thanks again to Dave Burgess for being with us. Don't forget to stop by acrossthehallpodcast.com for the show notes and join the Across the Hall conversation on Twitter at hashtag X the Hall and follow us at Across the Hall where the O is a zero. We'd love it if you could also leave us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.